This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello and welcome or welcome back to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist and I've lived and worked in Fayetteville, Arkansas for about 28 years now. About five years ago, I decided to extend the walls of my practice and begin a podcast. You know, why not? (laughs) I wanted to reach those of you who might already be interested in psychological and emotional issues. I wanted to reach those of you who might be looking for answers because you've just been diagnosed with something. And also, I wanted to reach that group of you who might kind of shake your head and say, oh, I think that therapy stuff's kind of nuts, but you're curious enough or unhappy enough to listen to self-work. So welcome to all of you. We have a conversation today with Ashley Stahl, who is a career guru. Here's some facts about her. She was a counterterrorism professional, and she's turned career coach, spokesperson, and author of the best-selling book, U-Turn, Get Unstuck, Discover Your Direction, Design Your Dream Career. She's had two viral TEDx speeches. She teaches thousands of people online, and she has her own podcast, the U-Turn Podcast. She's been able to support clients in 31 countries to discover their best career path, upgrade their confidence, and land more job offers. She maintains a monthly career column in Forbes, and her work has also been featured in the Wall Street Journal, CBS, Self Magazine, Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, and more. But let me tell you what it was like to talk with Ashley. She's very quick, bright, compassionate, quick to laugh, and her advice and guidance about choosing a career or moving into a career, making a U-turn, is really stellar. She's not necessarily advising you to go toward your passion, but she wants your career to reflect your core values, your core skills, and your very nature, where your particular brand of energy can have the chance to be naturally expressed every day and bring you fulfillment and also a salary. And her very pragmatic but well thought out guidance, very organized guidance, is refreshing. Her book, U-Turn, isn't a checklist of to-dos about getting the perfect job for you, but it is chock full of personal stories that give her message context and power. I changed careers in my late 20s and took me nine years to do so, but it was very worth the time. I did my own U-Turn, and I certainly wish I'd had her book as I realize now how I stumbled around looking for the direction she provides in the book. But before I invite you into our discussion, here's an offer from BetterHelp, ranked the best virtual therapy service. Several of you have written in to tell me what an important part of your own healing BetterHelp has become. And here's their offer to you as a self-work listener. I'm always honored when one of you reaches out to me to ask, hey, could I see you? Unfortunately, right now, I can only see people in Arkansas, but I do have a suggestion for you. I've personally found that BetterHelp, the leading online therapeutic counseling service, is really a great option, and I've partnered with them here at SelfWork to provide you with a professional, very affordable, and trustworthy source of help, no matter where you live. In fact, BetterHelp has been a sponsor of SelfWork for more than a year, and I can't tell you how much it's meant to have their help and support here on the program. But of course, before any kind of relationship happened, I tried BetterHelp myself. They use only licensed therapists, meaning licensed professional counselors, social workers, marriage and family therapists, probably even some psychologists, and they match you up with someone likely in the same state as you if you're here in the United States. But I want to talk about what really stood out for me. I saw two different counselors, or (laughs) I didn't see them, but I worked with them. For one thing, it was very convenient, and they both tried their best to meet my schedule. The second thing was, you know, those of you on the podcast often write reviews or send me emails that say, hey, I really like that you make direct suggestions on what to try, real tangible recommendations. And the two counselors I tried did that as well. It's not that empathy and a listening ear isn't valuable. Sometimes we all can benefit from working through emotions in a safe relationship. However, I believe you get hope when you see yourself handling emotions that previously you couldn't Or maybe you speak up in meetings where before you didn't care enough to, or maybe your confidence was shot. You want to be able to see real change in yourself. Both of them actually offered worksheets for me to use to get a little deeper into things outside of the session. So I walked away with ideas. 
You know, we're still in the middle of a pandemic and everyone's lives have been challenged to a lesser or greater extent for a year or more. So that's the backdrop we all have to deal with. And BetterHelp wants to be there for you. But also because you listen to self-work, you do have a really good offer for them. You'll receive a 10% discount on your first month of service if you use this code. TryBetterHelp.com slash self-work. That's TryBetterHelp.com slash self-work. And you'll find a counselor uniquely chosen for your preferences and needs. And then, of course, write me and let me know how it goes. If your first counselor isn't a great fit for you, they'll find somebody else, just like in non-online therapy. And after all, so many counselors are only working online these days, and BetterHelp isn't expensive. So try BetterHelp, because reaching out can be so vital to your mental health. So now please listen into some of the best advice I've ever heard about how to find a career that not only fits you, but keeps you growing. I invite you to meet Ashley Stahl. Today, I'm so excited that we have Ashley Stahl here with us. She is a phenomenal writer. I'm about three quarters of the way through her book. I've watched her TED Talks. Um, Ashley, welcome to Self Work. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. Oh, well, we tried to do this before and your poor dog had to go to the vet. And oh, my gosh. <laughs> that was great. Is, is your dog okay? Thank you for checking on him. You know, I am learning how to be a dog mom. He's only 18 months and oh, he's my goodness. still a puppy and he's a 90 pound German shepherd. So <laughs> I'm learning so much about patience and love through him. So oh, sure. Yeah, Good for better. you. Good Thank for you. Well, I'm glad he's okay. Your book, as I read it, for one thing, when I was watching your TED Talks, I thought I'm sort of watching the evolution of Ashley. I mean, it, from your first TED Talk, I could see you expanding your thinking and using more of your own life to bring into what you had to teach others. I agree. It's on the back. I think someone says, style stories are gripping. I couldn't put this book down and her insights are sharp and unique. I mean, I, I felt the same way. It was just really great. But it, the book isn't just about careers. It's about life. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. You know, I don't think I've come across many books where it feels like it's either charts and tables and action steps, or it's a mindset leadership book. And I wanted to connect with my reader and process my life with myself holding their hand as they process theirs. And the thing about your career is that you know, so many people, you know, I talk about in the book how they say they need clarity when really they're just disconnected from themselves. And that's why this concept of making a U-turn, a Y-O-U turn and coming home to yourself was so core for me. And there's so many factors that influence our career beyond the scope of just our skills or our interests. Our childhood influences our career. Um, what tr challenges we've had, baby traumas that we've had, positive relationships we've had. They all influence our beliefs about success, about possibility. And I just didn't feel responsible writing a career book on the external tactical things that people could do without also addressing the mental limitations and experiences that we all have. And it was really vulnerable to share about my own anxiety or different life events that had happened to me. But what I do find as a writer that is such an honor is that in the same way, somebody who has like a medical diagnosis and they can't seem to find out what it is and they're running around to doctors and then finally the day comes where they find out what it is, even if it's bad news, whatever that diagnosis is, there's like a level of relief that they know what they're working with. And I feel like a, a good writer can help people make sense of their lives and of their careers when they can put words to the, to the soup that is floating through our minds. <laughs> and so I, I really tried to create, you know, it's an 11-step roadmap to get clarity on your next career move, but to make it something that people could really do a deep dive self-reflection and not just grab onto another career path thinking that maybe that thing is the next quick fix. Uh, you know, I know how afraid people are when they're making a career decision or a career change. 
of taking the wrong thing again and being stuck again. It's such a hopeless feeling. So I wanted to go deep and I'm I'm so honored that you're three quarters of the way through it. Oh, I've, I've really enjoyed it. Um, it's You're reminding me of something that I tell people frequently about career or really anything. I say, it's not the direction that you go that matters. It's that you go and yeah. that you begin the energy to search. And you're saying passion doesn't equate with reality. Yeah. And my own story, I was a professional singer in my 20s, which was my passion, but it didn't work out career-wise. So yeah. I really love that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think too many people who have an artist's soul are trying to make work out of their art. And sometimes we are meant for our art to be just art. And that's where its purpose is inside of us, not work. And um, there's a big difference I talk about in the book between being a consumer of something versus a producer of something. So I'm a consumer of politics and fashion. I love fashion and I love baked goods, (laughs) but (laughs) I'm definitely not supposed to be a politician. I tried that, you know. I'm not supposed to be a fashion designer, and I'm especially not supposed to be a baker. And so if there's anything I've learned, it's the ability to love something doesn't always translate in the skills that are required to do something and to do it well. And according to research, we tend to like things that we're good at. So just because you're interested in art or, or something like that or food, if you don't have that natural talent and skill to back it, you're in for an upward battle with yourself. And so my intention is to commit to flow for people, help people start to notice where they have natural abilities and help them start to realize how many options truly exist out there for them under the umbrella of where they're gifted. Uh, We live in a world where we're domesticated at such a young age. You know, I remember in kindergarten, I was told about being a doctor, a lawyer, an astronaut, and a teacher, and a veterinarian. And that was it. And so I think I kind of (laughs) grew up just like everyone with not a lot of insight on what's truly out there. And I think that lack of knowing translated into me committing to something that wasn't truly for me. And I think that's happening for a lot of people. Well, that's one of the very dramatic stories you tell in the book and about figuring out that going into a military-like kind of uh, career was not going to be one for you. I don't want to ruin – there are so many stories I don't want to ruin for people. So so let's talk a little bit about your the core nature. Yeah. Um, I, you know, you have core nature, core skill set, and core values that Love those. you talk a lot about. So um, – How does someone find out what their core nature is? I feel like you might have your skills making sense for your job. You might like the people, but what people don't calculate when they're choosing a career is their energy levels and how their energy comes across. So there's kind of two dynamics to a core nature. The first question for anybody who's trying to determine theirs is, what is my energy in the room when I'm in my most natural state? And so uh, you can find a lot out by talking to friends or people who are noticing you because according to research, we are not our best at noticing ourselves, Um, you know, and so getting feedback from people who know you in what you would say is your most natural state saying, how would you describe the room and how it changes when I walk in? What energy do I bring to the room? But another thing to calculate around this is what is your natural energy levels? Like for me, Um, I was recently diagnosed with Lyme disease, but I've actually probably had it for a decade because I think back when I was living in D.C. and working in counterterrorism, I think I got bit bit by a tick back then. And I've gotten sick very easily, like a bit immunocompromised. So I'll get a cold or a flu and I always get the 10th degree of it or whatever have you. And that really influenced my career as an entrepreneur. So. I know that if I have a speaking engagement in London and then I have a wedding in Vegas, that I'm not going to make it to one of them because I'm going to, and it's, it's a very careful dance of not making a story up about myself and making it a self-fulfilling prophecy and kind of deciding that it's going to be rough for me and knowing thyself, really knowing thyself like, oh, wow, when I take a red eye flight, I need, I need a whole day to adjust to a time zone. So I think people are making career choices 
without knowing what their core nature is, without knowing what words people would use to describe their energy in a room, and also without knowing what their energy levels are, whether they're an introvert or an extrovert or even an ambivert. There's a lot of research on that. Um, really understanding what they bring to the table in that way. And also, you know, some of the words people have used when I say, well, how does the room change when I walk in? They say, oh, you're chatty and bubbly and you're wise. You have a lot of depth. And I just think to myself, who do I know that's making money who's chatty and bubbly and wise and has a lot of depth? And I actually thought of my talent agent. I thought of uh, actually my real estate agent. I thought about this business development person uh, that helped me set up my Facebook ads. And I thought, you know, there, there's so much I can say about skill set, which we could talk about, but, you know. Let's, let's uh, go there. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, my, so in the book, I talk about the 10 core skill sets that I believe exist in the workforce. And obviously, Let's see, I, I have those right in front of me. They oh, are words, innovation, building, technology, motion, service, beauty, coordination, analysis, and numbers. Wow. I love your notes. You are like me, a woman after my own heart. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, dear. yeah. You know, I can't obscure the human experience into 10 skills, but what I can say is that these umbrellas largely house most people in the workforce. And the work of knowing your core skill set is about knowing where you're best, where you lead. So, for example, you mentioned words. That's absolutely my core skill set. And I actually worked in a preschool for my first job when I was 16. <laughs> and my job was to help the chef prepare meals for the kids. But I would always notice typos in their marketing brochures. So always, <laughs> and I would always say, hey, you guys have a typo or, hey, the sentence is a run on. And eventually my core skill set, my foundational capability of words would always shine through. You can put me at a burger joint flipping burgers and I'm going to find a way to make money out of words. And so I think what's important important is that sometimes your core skill set is so obvious for you that you don't even realize it is a skill set and that it's not so obvious for other people. Yeah, I, I love the division of these and just discernment of, well, you know, how would I, if I were going to form a hierarchy of, of yeah. how I, what I think I do well or what, as you say, my friends, acquaintances, I remember one time going to a workshop years ago. It was really, it was, it was 25 years ago. And at the end of the workshop, uh, there were a lot of therapists there. There were some lawyers there because it was on mediation. And one of one person turned to me, and I didn't quite know how to take this, but she said, do you realize that when you talk, people get quiet and they listen to you? Mm-hmm. And I took it so, certainly as a compliment, and yet I've realized that, you know, the people I'm attracted to are the people that I get quiet and listen to. Yeah. And so when you say, you know, that's really something that you want to consider, I, I just think it's wonderful to listen to what other people are telling you they know that your skill set is. Absolutely. And even according to relationship research, you know, um, the data is indicating that friends know if your marriage will last more than you will. And, and it, I think it's the same with your career. You know, people know they can see alignment or not because they have no skin in the game. They now have no bias. They don't care how much money you're making or how, you know, how much importance you get from your job. They can see, is this person happy with what they're doing or not? And, it, and it's that simple. But when it comes to your core nature, your core energy, I think that you um, having a gift with words as a skill set also translates when you look at your nature. What I'm hearing is that you have a sense of captivation for people. And it's interesting that you have that because according to research, the most memorable human emotion is having a sense of awe or captivation. So I would think it would be love or some warm feeling, but the ability to captivate is the ability to be memorable. And it makes sense to me that you have abilities with words. So, you know, when it comes to these core skill sets, and I can kind of expand on these 10 so that whether or not anybody I'd reads love that. Book, yeah, love that it. way, if, if nobody reads the book, at least they can take this away. Well, they the should book. read the book. I, it's it's really, really good. Thank you. Yeah, I um, well, we'll start with innovation, um, okay. you know, in no particular order. This is for the visionary, the creative self-starter. Maybe you're an entrepreneur or an intrapreneur. And the real distinction here is asking yourself, um, what is your relationship to money with risk? And what is your relationship with freedom? I found that creative, uh, that the entrepreneurs need creative freedom 
all out. Like they need to be working on their idea. Um, They need time freedom. They need to work when it's effective for them. And they are willing to have financial risk in exchange for that. Okay. Intrapreneur doesn't need all out freedom, but they usually need autonomy, meaning you can hand them an idea, but give them space to go create it because they're very entrepreneurial. So this is where that um, dichotomy of extrovert and introvert you're talking about. So the entrepreneur and the in the ex- somewhat, yeah. is that, I mean, is that what you mean? Yes and no. I mean, okay. So that's actually a really good point from the book as well. Is you want to consider when you look at your skill set whether you're an introvert or an extrovert because words is both of our skill set, and I'm actually probably fifty one percent an introvert. So what that means is I have to be alone um, for a certain portion of the day. Like I cannot thrive if I'm in conversation all day, and. Um, that makes me look more like a writer and a podcaster versus a speaker and a YouTuber. Um, You know, externally, words is going to look like me on stage. It's going to look like me, um, you know, using my words with people a lot. And so it's important to understand, do you want to experience your core skill set internally or externally? And so when it comes to innovation, the entrepreneur could be an extrovert. They could be someone who likes to chat with people, likes to be around people all day long. Um, But it's more about their relationship to freedom and financial risk still. These people tend to prefer the security that comes with a paycheck, um, but they want that autonomy to be creative. Um, An extroverted innovator is going to find a way to be around people, to be in collaboration. An introverted um, innovator is going to find a way to innovate alone, whether they're an entrepreneur or an intrapreneur, meaning that they work within a company. Um, The second core skill set is building. So this is a metaphor as much as it's tactical. You know, you could literally be a builder like a construction worker, or you could be a a management consultant. You could be someone who um, is very strategic and um, you build something with your mind. Like maybe you are building a brand or you are restructuring a company. Uh, Mentally, your energy is focused on building and putting something together. Um, I feel like I actually reside in building quite a bit when it comes to personal branding. Um, I spend a lot of time, you know, not just coaching and writing and podcasting, but also really saying to myself, like, what's the next block that I need to build in my brand um, just out of responsibility as an entrepreneur in the world? And and then number four is motion. That is um, quite literal, like the people who are on their feet all day. This is a skill. This is the tour guides, even the hairstylists, though they might also be under beauty. And and I, I hope people are noticing that one job title can be under different skill sets. It's sure, about how course. you're using your skill set, right? Um, you know, it's interesting. Another skill set that I have listed is analysis. And when I worked in counterterrorism at the Pentagon, I remember thinking to myself, this is a great job for me because I'm like writing a lot of intelligence reports and I love words and writing. But what I didn't realize is that was not really the words core skill set. Writing the book U-Turn was the words core skill set, giving my speeches and my TED Talks and my podcast, you know, but I was actually residing in analysis, which is the complete opposite side of my brain, you know, the analytical mind versus the creative mind. Sure. And when you're when you're pushing a river, when you're trying to be someone else, it's exhausting. And I, I truly think that burnout is just a reflection of walking on a path that isn't meant for you anymore. It is interesting, too, because I know the research on burnout shows that you're literally working from a different brain. The chemistry of your brain Exactly, exactly. So fascinating because people are always wondering, why is it so hard to suddenly do the things that used to be so easy? It's like, yeah, your your brain changed, you know, you're working against your neurons. But um, it's it's interesting when it comes to these skill sets, like we talked about innovation, building, words, motion, analysis. Another one is service, number six. The thing to note about that one is where is your skill set coming from? Like, for example, I had a client who really tragically lost her parents at a very young age, and she was the oldest of three siblings. And so she was the caretaker for her two younger siblings at a very young age. And she thought service was her core skill set. 
But really, it was the trauma of losing her parents and having to be in service all the time, helping and generous. It was familiar. So it was familiar. It was familiar to her. And so I think it's important when you choose your skill set to ask yourself, and I'm sure that everybody resonates with two or three of these. We're multifaceted beings, but ultimately my intention is pick which one you truly lead with. Know that one first and foremost. The other two matter, but not quite like the first one. And so she was saying service and she was building a career that burnt her out. She was just not just um, of service to everyone, but in service. It was like so much exhaustion that I was seeing on her. And when she discovered and she and then she thought her secondary course skill set was coordination when really it was like, no, you just had to like make lunch for your little siblings and do this and that and take them to the doctor and This is not who you naturally are. When she actually looked at it, her natural skill set was another one that I could talk about, which is beauty. Um, And she's very aesthetic and she learned beauty uh, and naturally had a gift for it. And it was a way that she would self-soothe. So she would always make sure that her home was a very beautiful environment. Whenever I would meet up with her, she wanted to be in beautiful environments. She always picked the most aesthetically pleasing coffee shops. She herself put herself together. She ended up being a cosmetic dentist at one point, making teeth aesthetically perfect. So the point is that there's a big difference between a skill set and an experience we've had through life, through trauma, through challenges. Well, you know, um, I, I work a lot in perfectionism and depression, and I think there's a certain persona that you can that can be a reasonable and actual very functional adaptation to childhood trauma that, again, can become who you believe you are. But underneath that is a lot of uh, even destructive forces. So, uh, but so I think that you know, if she was burning out on service and and on those kinds of things that it was it's a wonderful gift that she that you gave her to be able to say don't you see that these other things are really who you are not who you had to adapt to being to fit a need exactly yeah so much of our being in our everyday life is a coping mechanism until we see it and get leverage on it and it's like we come into the world and our thermostat is set by our family, like what we think is possible, what we think is available, who we think we are, what we think is audacious, what we think is, you know, across the board. And I had a business coach once and her kid walked in during a coaching session with me and her and she said, hey, honey, I'm, you know, coaching a client. And I looked at him. He was so cute. And he said, one day, he said, I'm going to have so many clients. And I just remember <laughs> thinking, like, a pretty good thermostat that she set for him. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so great. that might not be one that he has to question or, or notice. That mm. one's going to work for him, probably. Well, that one's built on the sense of safety and security, too. Exactly. So rather than insecurity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And And that's the thing with me and in my book is that I grew up in a house where my dad you know, he had a business that he had to close and he went through huge financial loss. I myself repeated his pattern in my business. And, you know, until we notice that it owns us and it runs us. And so knowing your core skill set truly where you're naturally gifted is so important. So we talked about innovation, building, words, motion, service, analysis. Um, And then we also mentioned coordination, which is the one that my client had also thought she had, the event planners, the project managers, the operation strategists. And then number uh, eight is numbers. So the number cruncher is pretty straightforward. And number nine is technology, which is for you know our artificial intelligence creators. I know right now we are living in a massive quickening where technology is making everything more efficient and then sometimes less efficient when you call yes. the bank and get the robot. <laughs> Um, And then number 10 is beauty, which we talked about, too, with my client who really discovered that. And and that could look like being an artist, a musician, an actor. There's many ways to identify with beauty. I just think those are so helpful to understand and to claim and, and actually allow yourself to to think more creatively about yourself and less in the sense of I I. I may have thought this was who I was, but I really have evolved and realized that I'm, 
I'm living by old rules. I'm living by, you know, the things that I was told I should, ought, must, have to do or be. And then to realize, wait a minute, maybe those rules don't apply anymore. And I actually have more of a natural skill in these other areas. I think it's wonderfully, obviously, organization is, is one of your, <laughs> one of your um, talents as well, because all of this is very well organized. Thank you for saying that. So let's talk. I really want to touch on fear. Mm -hmm. I love, in fact, kind of chills went down my spine when I read, what do you know that you wish you didn't know? Mm -hmm. And can you talk about why that's so important and how that answer can change you? Yeah. I mean, one of the biggest things I've learned in my life is that happiness can be quite inconvenient. Because we build our life based on a version of ourselves that exists in the present moment. We make these big decisions. And yet over time, we are living, breathing, growing organisms. We change. And suddenly that pair of pants that fit us, that home that fit us, that life that fit us feels like it doesn't. And in those moments, we really have one of two choices. We can either accept that this is where we are and stay that way. Uh, and a lot of people who are there, they say the word fine a lot, like I'm fine. But I truly feel like when I hear people say that they're fine, they're just not in touch with their pain because nobody wants to just be fine. Like we want to be great. We want to be happy. We want to be alive. And for me, I value my aliveness so much. I'm more afraid of not feeling alive than I am of anything else. But the other choice is to make a change. And a lot of the time, you know, that's the U-turn. That's the moment where you get really honest with yourself about something that's not working for you. And it makes me think a lot about Byron Katie and her book, Loving What Is. Um, she has a quote. She says, I love you until I don't. And it's so <laughs> funny that she says that. I mean, th there's such a fine line between the truth and what we want it to be, you know, um, what it is and what we wish it was. And so for me, I have made the life decision as, an, as a writer and as a soul here on the planet that I'm more committed to truth and to myself than anything else. And what that means is that I have a higher level of devotion in my life to that. And if something isn't working, I'm not afraid to own it. I own a, um, I own a ghostwriting company called Cake Publishing. Just the other day, we had a really large client contract come in. It was significant. And I've been so committed to working with clients that we enjoy and I could tell my team wasn't going to have fun with them. And I really value how happy my team is and how great and smart they are at writing. And so I declined this half a million dollar contract with this wow. client mm -hmm. because I just, I'm more committed to my happiness and my joy than I am anything else. And I know that that money is going to come with so many headaches and and, and the joy of, of of those around you, you don't. Yeah. I mean, you're going to change the whole zeitgeist of the company if you allowed that kind of decision making to to make it more of a financial decision than a exactly than a, a emotional decision or a, a or a moral decision almost. Hundred percent, and it's been really tough in those moments to accept the truth of what I know. Um, I also am 34 years old, and I've ended a few long-term relationships with partners that were really good because something in my soul really knows that there's great out there for me. And I'm not a perfectionist. I am just someone who I live through feeling and it makes sense. I mean, we have more than 200 million neurons in our gut, which is why scientists call it our second brain. There's an intelligence to when you feel butterflies in your stomach or you feel a sinking feeling or a excited feeling. And it's these are all breadcrumbs in our life. And so I think a lot of fear comes up when people feel the winds of change starting to blow upon them. They start to ask themselves, like, do, you know, do I have to listen to this? And they ignore it for years. And some people ignore, you know, when I ask the question, what do you know that you wish you didn't? I would argue that a lot of people listening right now know that they need to go to the doctor over something. Um, they know that they're in the wrong relationship. They know that they don't like where they live. Geography is such a big deal for people's happiness. They know that they made some, they have some sort of apology they need to give someone. There's so much we know at any time. And knowing something and not acting on it, that is knowing something meaningful for our lives and not acting on it, it hurts our self esteem, it hurts sure our self worth. So I just want to stand for people. You know, there's a great quote by Dan Sullivan, the life coach. He says, 
Fear is wetting your pants and courage is doing what you're supposed to do with your wet pants. (laughs) It's true. It's like we're taught that fear means don't, but really fear is just an indicator. It's time to get your courage on. And a lot of the times when people feel fear, to me, it means they're moving towards something good. They're moving towards something that is a challenge and and a growth for them. And, you know, nobody wants to be the same person today in 10 years. Everybody wants to be growing. That's what life is about. I was just this morning talking to a client about the idea that she was very agitated, but about something she wanted to go toward, but she could feel herself. She says, I know that I need to go toward this. And I said, so just embrace that agitation. That agitation is a sign that you're growing and that, you know, you, you, yes, you're a little afraid. You're, you're, you're scared of what you're going to find out, but you also don't want you're also scared of not finding it out. And that is more motivating than staying where you are and just staying, you know, scared of not scared of making the change. So exactly it. And and that's the thing is that we're so hard wired for immediate gratification that we make choices right now that feel good, but we don't really touch base with our future self who is going to have so much more of a visceral pain by avoiding what we know. So I I don't I don't want to not talk about the other things that you talk about that you focus on in the book the eleven steps toward the U turn and it makes a lot of sense to to go through all eleven. Um, do you think there's one that maybe is harder or do you think is more expansive or something more important than others or? Yeah, I actually think you're touching on some of the most important ones. The other one that you'd mentioned was core values. And I Mm -hmm. love talking about that because what I have found having coached hundreds of people in person and thousands online is that there's two core dynamics in your career. There's the what of what you do. That's your responsibilities. That's your core skill set. That's your core nature, your energy, and how it translates into your job. Then there's the how, which is how your job looks. Given that 50% of people leave their job because they don't like their boss, what we know to be true is that how your job looks matters just as much as what your job is. So even if you nail down your core skill set, if you, you know, are doing work where you are feeling very um, disconnected from the people or one of your values is integrity, for example. Let's say you're a words person and you work in sales, but you also value integrity. So even if the job itself is aligning with your skill set, you value integrity, but you have to sell something you don't believe in. That's a violation of your values. Right. It's a quick path to being really unhappy with your work. Psychologists would call that a congruence between your values and then your behavior. Exactly. Exactly. And so I would say it's so important that people are able to ask themselves, what are my core values? And I think a lot of people get off course when trying to determine what theirs are. And the reason for that is because they get too focused on words that they wish they were more of. They're a little too aspirational versus words that truly represent the non-negotiable principles by which they live their life. Mm -hmm. So, You know, I would love peace to be a core value, but I'm, you know, I'm hustling all the time. I'm moving around. I'm moving to New York City next week. I'm just all over the place. I can't claim peace as a value. It's an aspiration, which is super useful to know. But one of my values is authenticity. And like I said, I declined that contract because it wasn't authentic for me. Those values dictate my decision making. They're a filter for my choices. And so I would say setting aside some time to perhaps even talk to a friend and really get intimate with that question of who are you? In couples work uh, frequently, in fact, it's why um, the four agreements is such an important book because it's really talking about the values that are most important in a in a relationship. List your three most important values. What what do you value? And then I've asked them, are you living those values in your relationship? And what would it look like if you were? And yeah. it can be really um, life-altering because they realize how far away from the values that they treasure they have gotten. How did you come up with these values? Yeah, you know, it's not an, an exhaustive list, but it's a pretty long list of different words. So for everybody listening, um, you know, words like authenticity, balance, spirituality, friendship, connection, humor, um, play, fun, the list really yeah. goes on. And uh, I think 
like you're talking about with romantic relationships, one thing that gets so missed is defining core values. Like I had a client who he told me he values adventure. And when I asked him, well, what does that mean for you? He said skydiving and like adrenaline seeking things. I had another client and she, you know, she's in Miami. I said, what is it? And she said adventure. And I said, what does that mean for you? And she said, try new restaurants. And I just thought, well, she better not get paired with that guy, you know, <laughs> in her life. He's going to ruin her core value for her. And so I think it's important that you don't just look in partnerships, whether it's a job that you're taking or a relationship that you're building and say, oh, this person values X and I value X. It's what does X mean to this person? And a lot of that was shaped in the family you grew up in and the culture you grew up in, all of that kind of thing. We were talking about that before, that that becomes your definition of adventure. So exactly 100 percent. And you know, it it means so much for your career that you are able to lock in, I would say at least no more than five values. I think more than that, it becomes hard to make decisions from them when you're juggling so many principles. But if you can have five values, it's not about each job meeting the value. It's about the job honoring the values. What that means is if you value family, the job needs to be structured in a way where you feel like whatever you need from family is going to work. Um, if you value balance, you know, some people, for example, talk about defining values. For me, balance looks like working like a crazy person for three months and then I take a month off. Other people, it looks like nine to five, steady Eddie. And I love those people whenever I'm around them. You know, um, they either think I'm so available because I'm in my little vacation mode or I'm so busy because I'm in my work mode and I just have a different definition of balance. So, I think uh, anyone listening or anyone who gets the book, use that chapter as a conversation starter with your friends at dinner of what do they value? What are the words that resonate with them? And a lot of the words seem alike, but they're not. Um, People will look at the word growth and then they'll look at the word learning and they'll think it's the same thing. But to me, learning is the collection of information. I know a lot of people love to know information. Growing is the application Mm -hmm. of information as it relates to you, not just information about the world. So everybody has a different definition, but I would encourage people who think about their values to not only avoid being aspirational, but to also really define these words and see the nuances beyond them. So let me ask you, because uh, you mentioned, and I'm glad you did, you, you have a coursework that's available online to everyone, and it's and you've been very, very successful at that. But you talk about your own childhood experiences, your own experiences as an adult, uh, your sexual abuse being one of them. Yeah. And how how did you turn that? I mean, I've you know, worked with a lot of people who've been sexually abused, and how did you use that experience or what did you learn from that experience or how did it change you that is a part of the way you're formulating your ideas now? Yeah, I'm so excited that you asked about this because I think it's something that a lot of podcast hosts might steer away from because like sexual abuse feels like such an ugly topic and in a lot of the ways it can be. But what's so important is that there are factors and forces in our everyday career being, who we are, how we show up, that have nothing to do with your career. Your energy is influenced by so many different things. So for me, being sexually abused at a young age from a boy that I had known my whole life, um, most of my life, was an influence on me having anxiety. And what would happen was I would see this kid around on an ongoing basis, and it kept renewing this sense of unsafety inside Mm -hmm. of me. Mm -hmm. And I walked around the world from age seven onwards with this unsafety, anxiety, fear of men, fear of boys. And I mean, given that they're 50% of the population, it's safe to say that I'm like re-traumatized every day. And the thing about trauma is it's not about what happens. It's about what we think about what happens, right? So, For me, um, my body repressed the memory until I turned 16 years old. I didn't remember that that had happened to me. You just had this anxiety that you didn't understand. Exactly. And I think a lot of people have that. And I do trust that the unconscious is very powerful. It's not releasing information to people that, that can't handle it. I think that your unconscious is a very unique force, you know, choosing to release information as it does. And I'm glad it gave me until age 16 to be able to process that information. But my body remembered it. And whenever I was around boys, 
I was quivering inside. And so I think it's important for people to ask themselves, what events have happened in your life? And, you know, given that one out of three women experienced some form of sexual abuse, it felt really important for me to write about this experience and show how this anxiety carried into my career path. Um, Because we live in a world where, you know, it's interesting, I took my little niece to the fabric store the other day and, and she wanted chalk. She wanted white chalk. And I saw a box of black and white chalk. Um, and I said, Oh, well, let's look at that one. And there were 50 different shades of black and white in that thing in the box. Wow. And I was like, this is life. You know, there is, we live in the gray and mm. the problem is that we want certainty and our desire for certainty keeps us from really the truth, which is that we are groundless. You know, a pandemic came out of nowhere and everybody's plans and finances and life was jumbled up. And and we're we're more close to reality, I think, in the groundlessness of that than we are with anything else. And so, you know, my work has been how do I create safety for myself? How do I take note of the things that have hurt me? And how do I take responsibility for them? Because if I wasn't working on my anxiety, I would be pretty unpleasant to be around. I think I'd be projecting it on people. Like, you know, when you're around someone who's worried about stuff, you're not worried about at all. And they keep bugging you. Like, what about this? What about that? Did you print off that extra thing? It's like a it, you feel nagged because they're so worried and you're not and you're peaceful. I think that me having anxiety would probably look like that if I didn't work on it. Like, is this okay? Is that okay? But because I've been so committed to it and I've had it in my awareness and and how it shows up in my career, um, I have been able to get dominion over it, put it in the back seat of my car versus let it be the driver. Right. And that's my wish for anybody who reads the book is that they don't just learn about what their skills are, what their values are, how to get job offers, but they also learn what experiences really influenced how they show up in the world and how do they want to relate to those and process those now? And that's why I, I pointed out at the beginning of the interview, Ashley, that I think the book is not only about achievement in a career, but it's also about really getting to know yourself as a person and not allowing not not allowing yourself to settle or not allowing yourself to just to not question and and to pay attention to these feelings that your fears your your burnout you know whatever it happens to be that that's happening for a reason i was so glad that in my late 20s i listened to my unhappiness i listened to the chaos i was creating and I realized, you know, I need to do something else in my life. It took me nine years to turn the boat around and do something else, but it was a hugely important decision in my life. So I think you're trying to help people find that. In fact, I I told you in an email that I sent your materials to my son. He was 27, and I said, he has a great career where he is, but he also is still searching. And so I thought, okay, this is what he needs to read. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think I think it's never too late to self-discover. It's never too late to decide to get back on your path, to be able to give yourself permission to be the fluid, changing, growing organism that you are. Because, And that's my message in the book and in my life is that Your career is a vehicle. It's a vehicle for self-expression. It's a vehicle for self-actualization. And we spend 90,000 hours of our time at work. That's two-thirds of our waking time on this planet. And so it makes sense that people want it to count. And I think taking the time to reflect and make sure that you're making art of your life and that you're happy with what you're doing is so important. I could not agree more. I want to show the book. This is U-Turn. Um, and Ashley also has course. Where, where can we find your coursework? Oh, I love. Thank you for asking. Well, everything on my website at ashleystahl.com is there. It's A-S-H-L-E-Y-S-T-A-H-L. And the course for clarity that kind of takes the book deeper is called the Career Clarity Lab. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being on. As I was reading the book, I thought, okay, I didn't do this part, but then I sort of did this, and it was interesting to see, and I'm still doing it, because Mm -hmm. I may be 66 years old, but I've got things on my bucket list still. (laughs) Yeah, you also have a good skincare plan. I'm looking at your face this whole time, thinking, like, you said you're 66, like, what, you got to email me the links to whatever you're doing, truly. Well, I wish that it was really good care. I do have a wonderful uh, woman who helps me, but for years, I did absolutely nothing. Wow. (laughs) Let that give me hope. 
Well, thank you for having me and everybody listening. I'm so happy that we had this time. Well, I'm I'm delighted to have you on Self Work and and we'll keep reading your books and taking your courses and thank you for your gifts to all of us. I hope you enjoyed that. I really truly loved her company and her advice and her words. Her energy is infectious. Thank you so much for being here. I wanted to let you know about a couple of things that are coming up. If you're a therapist, I'm offering a continuing education course with CEU on September the 30th from, I believe it's 830 to 1130 in the morning, Central Standard Time. The link will be in the show notes, and I'd love to have you there. I've also got a course on Himalaya, Himalaya himalaya.com slash depression called Facing Depression. It's about all kinds of depression. And when you click there, you'll have a full week to look around, not only at my own course, which actually is divided into 10 separate 10-minute, 15-minute sections, but other people's work. It's a great site, and I'd love to have you there. Thanks again to Ashley Stahl. Thank you all for your ratings and reviews about the book Perfectly Hidden Depression, as well as on Apple Podcasts or wherever you subscribe to the Self Work Podcast. I'm Dr. Margaret. This has been Self Work.